Commission's Joint Research Centre. I'm uh, currently in the north of Italy and uh, I'd like to welcome you today to this uh, specific session on soil uh, in relation to the development uh, of a, a mission for soil health uh, for, for Europe. Uh, this is one of the only two sessions uh, on soil uh, within the ESOF programme. And maybe I can draw attention to the fact that uh, there will be another one tomorrow evening uh, on uh, virtuous agriculture. So maybe just to draw people's attention to that. Uh, before I introduce this morning's um, group of distinguished panelists, uh, I'd like just to provide a few words of context and explain what the soil health mission is, is all about. So I hope you can see the, uh, the, pr the presentation on the screen. moment please Oops. so the, the the european union basically has uh, decided that uh, within the context of the next uh, research program which will be called horizon europe which starts uh, in 2021 that uh, it will develop a series of uh, programs known as missions uh, and these missions are based uh, let's say on the same concept uh, as the mission to put people on the moon in the 1960s. So uh, a, a, a targeted effort to address uh, a major challenge. Uh, the missions should be uh, inspirational. Uh, they have, uh, sorry, they have um, uh, broad societal uh, uh, aspirations. Uh, they should be targeted. Uh, uh, to, to, to give a, a consistent result. Um, th the impact should be measurable, they should be done within a, within a certain period, and they should also be uh, ambitious. And where possible, they should try to draw um, from knowledge across different disciplines and, and different stakeholders. Uh, and they should be more than just simply research activities which the, the European Commission and the EU have been doing uh, in the past. Now, the, uh, it was decided that uh, there should be a mission entitled Caring for Soil is Caring for Life, uh, because this wants to target, the, let's say, the broad 
lack of recognition in society of the importance of healthy soils, uh, specifically in providing us with uh, nutritious food, but also in relation to the vital ecosystem services that soils uh, provide to, to, the, to the planet and to the people who live in here and the environment. And we'll hear a bit more about this uh, in, a, in a little while. The issue is, of course, that uh, soil is a, a non-renewable resource in, in the context of, of human life, and it takes hundreds of years to, to, to regenerate or to restore soils. So there is a, a need to tackle the pressures that are leading to soil degradation. In parallel, uh, soils are increasingly seen as uh, uh, the cornerstones of a range of policy issues. Uh, both within the European Union, specifically here you can see in relation to the Green Deal, uh, and agriculture, biodiversity, pollution, and so, so on, but also into a, a broader international context in terms of uh, climate change mitigation, uh, the protection of biodiversity, uh, and so on. So there's a, an increasing policy appreciation of the need uh, to protect soils and use them in, in a sustainable manner. And that's basically the focus of this morning session. There is an urgency to this because uh, it's estimated that around 70% of all soils in Europe are uh, unhealthy, uh, basically reflecting inappropriate land management practices. And these soils are also being affected by air pollution and climate change that are causing increased pressures on their, on their, uh, on their capacity. So, for example, we, there are almost 3 million uh, potentially contaminated sites in Europe, but we only know about a quarter of them. There are, most agricultural soils have issues with the nutrient inputs that affects water and soil quality. Uh, soils are losing carbon, and so therefore the uh, possibilities to mitigate the effects of climate change are reduced. And we have more than a quarter of Europe has unsustainable uh, soil erosion uh, by water, which is basically uh, affecting uh, productivity, uh, water quality, uh, and so on. And maybe just to highlight that the costs associated with soil degradation are enormous, so around 50 billion euros per year. So there's a, there's a, a real need to address these. So what, what, what the mission aims to do is to try and restore uh, at least 50% of degraded land and, and increase the soil carbon stocks in such a way that uh, by 2030, at least three quarters of the soils in all the EU member states are considered as healthy uh, and therefore are able to provide the ecosystem services that, uh, that, that we need. And there are a number of measures here that uh, the mission wants to propose uh, to member states to, to act. Uh, it's going to do this in, in a number of ways. It's going to do it by targeted uh, research and innovation programs. It's going to demonstrate, uh, let's say, um, best practices through living laboratories and lighthouse concepts. Uh, it will also aim to collect better information, better data on the state of soils through a a robust soil monitoring program and then indicators that uh, reflect that information and maybe more importantly there will be a large drive to communicate uh, to citizens and engage with them uh, with different stakeholders on the need to uh, improve and maintain soil health. In parallel the EU will try to provide the supporting uh, policy framework uh, within the different uh, thematic areas where soils have, a, uh, have a, um, a, a role to play in relation to agriculture, pollution and so on. But also it will try to drive uh, consumer choice to be aware that uh, what they are buying uh, has an impact on, on, on the soil resource and, and the quality of, of soils. So there's a, it's not simply, as I said, a, a, a research program, but it's a, a package of measures that aim to, aim to provide soil health and, and, and allow that uh, people and society are, are more aware and more appreciative of the need to, to have, a, uh, let's say, a, a, a high quality, healthy soil base uh, for, their, for their lives. 
Now, there are uh, a lot more information available uh, on uh, the, the, the web link that you see here. Uh, there is a proposal uh, that describes in detail how this will be uh, implemented or could be implemented. There will be a major uh, discussion on uh, September the 21st where the, the, the commission will formally be proposed uh, the, the, the mission by the, the, the mission board. Uh, so I, I will stop there. That's my that's my last slide uh, as the as the introduction, uh, and uh, we will now have a, a series of presentations that uh, basically uh, pull out the key issues uh, are, are related to soil health. So the first presentation is by uh, Professor Peter de Reuter. Uh, he's joining us from the from the Netherlands. Uh, until very recently, he was the scientific director for the Institute of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Dynamics at the University of uh, Amsterdam. Uh, he's carried out a lot of research into the interrelationships between ecosystem processes and biological communities. And he is currently one of the European members of the International Technical Panel on Soils. And today he will explain how the ITPS is working to protect and restore soils across the world. So, Peter, <coughs> over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I will share my screen now. And hope this is visible for everybody. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman Arwin. Thank you very much for inviting me and in particular in organizing uh, this session. I hope it will be a success. Uh, originally, I was thinking about talking about science, my group in Amsterdam and saw biodiversity issues, but you requested to say something about the intergovernmental technical panel on Soros, where I'm a member of, and I thought, well, this is really a nice idea and I will do this uh, with pleasure. Um, Let's see how I can. Let's see. I have difficulties in getting the next. Right. Ah. So I reorganized my talk um, in four parts. I will say something very short about the societal agenda for the soil sciences. Then I will say something about the Global Soul Partnership. I will go to the ITPA. Yes, the Inbound Soils. And in particular, I will say something about uh, activities of the ITPS uh, uh, in the past, uh, ongoing and in the future. So the societal agenda for the soil sciences, I think that we all are aware that, let's say, at the start of this millennium, we became more and more um, uh, aware that the agenda became much more than before. Um, it was not, not only about food productivity anymore, uh, talking about nutrient availability or, or diseases control, but salts were also recognized to be very important for climate regulation, thinking about carbon sequestration on the long term, nutrient retention, it became much more attention for the role of soil in, in proper water management that can be enhanced by a good soil structure and aeration patterns in the soil. Of course, soil biodiversity, we will hear about it more in this session, and the threats to soil biodiversity, for example, soil disturbance, pollution, and others. And of course, also human health, which can be very strongly at first affected by soil degradation and soil pollution. The recognition of soil in all these environmental issues was also recognized in the recognition of the Sustainable Development Goals, where we can see that many of these goals are now explicitly addressed what soils can play in achieving uh, these goals. And that all yeah, it was the basis of an uh, initiative, uh, ERC, the Joint Research Center 
after the European Committee to start the so-called Global Soul Partnership. It's a sort of worldwide global cooperation of all kinds of countries, uh, institutes, uh, governments, with one aim, and that is to create healthy soils worldwide. And the Global Soil Partnership became under the suspicion, under the guidance of the World Food Organization, FAO, and the initiative of the GRC led that in 2011, the Global Soil Partnership was established. And in fact, all the member states of the FAO became also a member of the Global Soil Partnership. And in addition to that, there were various main research institutions, NGOs, uh, and also organization of soil professionals and practitioners who became members. So we now have more than 200 participants from more than 100 countries forming together the Global Soil Partnership. And uh, they meet every year in the plenary assembly. And uh, these are quite successful meetings. And I think the Global Soil Partnership has been a, a very successful organization in promoting sustainable soil management uh, worldwide. From the start of the Global Soil Partnership uh, formulated the plan of action and the plan of action consists of five pillars. Uh, of course, there's the worldwide promotion of sustainable soil management. Awareness, a uh, very important activity of the Global Soil Partnership. We think about the Soil World Day, we had the Year of Soils. There are very various educational programs for younger children, students, also to talk, to understand, to educate the value of soil in our society. There are activities to promote soil targeted research. And then the two last pillars are extremely important. There are a lot of activities now under the umbrella of the Global Soil Partnership to create global worldwide databases about soil quality, soil threats and opportunities all over the world. And there are also many activities going on to come up with a more of harmonization of the data, of the information by uh, standardized methods, uh, measurements and indicators for soil, sustainable soil management. So that all is a sort of framework of the activities and uh, that are more or less also guiding more particular, more uh, targeted uh, plans of actions uh, for now in the future. Now, part of the Global Soil Partnership, almost from the beginning, is the Intergovernmental inter Technical Panel on Soils. Now, what is that? Uh, well, it's, it's a committee uh, consisting of uh, soil scientists. And um, it started in 2013 at the Plenary Assembly at that time. Uh, there are 27 members, they come from all over the world representing regions and the members of the ITPS can serve two terms of three years. So there's a sort of turnover, rotation, and that enables to, to, to have as many countries as possible uh, providing uh, members of the ITPS uh, uh, to, uh, for now and the, and the future. And this is a picture of in fact the third ITPS which the ter of the term 2019 and to to until 2021. And to emphasize on the European delegation, we have five European members and they are elected by the European ambassadors at FAO. Uh, we have Rosa Poch from Spain and she's the chair of the ITPS. We have Maria Konchunkova from Russia. We have Costanza Consolari from Italy, Ellen Graeber from Israel, and myself from the Netherlands. And I'm the only one who is now serving a second term. So after 2021, uh, the, some of the others may have a second term as well. And what you also can see is that at FAO, uh, Europe is, is, is much larger than the European community. It also has uh, includes countries like Russia, Turkey, uh, Israel, and uh, so forth. Now there is, of course, a, a terms of reference for ITPS, which is many pages, but it all comes down to one thing. We have to give the scientific and technical advice, in particular to uh, GSP. 
and we are part of an international community. So we are a formal observer of the IPCC and we work closely together with IPBES, UNCCD. We are also part of the Katra Pudmil initiative to sequester carbon uh, worldwide. What did we do? What did we produce so far? Now, the first product of the ITPS is an update of the World Salt Chart. That was from 1981. It's a short document with some guidance for countries to sustainably manage their soil. Of course, it needed an update. Uh, in particular, the update is about the more diverse soil agenda. So now in the World Salt Chart, there's also some um, uh, information about issues like uh, pollution, uh, climate change, uh, biodiversity, and uh, urbanization. Um, this World Salt Charter, and like all other documents produced by ITPS, are freely available uh, on the internet uh, by means of the internet website of the FAO. In that same year, ITPS produced the Status of the World Soil Resources Report. That's an impressive uh, uh, piece of work. Uh, it's more than 600 pages. It gives an overview of uh, soil quality and soil health all over the world from all kinds of regions, along all kinds of uh, quality parameters like fertility, uh, carbon, nutrients, biodiversity, structure, pollution, and so forth. And it also presents trends of all these soil quality parameters for all the regions and uh, this uh, identify opportunities to improve soil health in the end coming up also with recommendations for farmers up to governments. Uh, for those who think 650 pages is a little bit too much, uh, there's also a synthesis report for some little more than 90 pages with the main findings, the conclusions and the recommendations. Again, freely available uh, from the web. Two years later, the ITPS produced the so-called voluntary guidelines for sustainable soil management. It's a quite short document. It gives very explicit and concrete recommendations for all the member countries. Been uh, very successful. Uh, first indication is that they are really uh, have impact in practices all over the world. There are evaluation programs now monitoring guidelines. And the ITP has produced a uh, global assessment of the influence of plant protection products. That is because these products can have very strong negative effects on all kinds of soil quality parameters, just like soil biodiversity, water quality, uh, sensitivity of erosion. Uh, again, it was a published program of the Global Soil Partnership. Then we also started to organize in global symposia. Yeah, the first was oh, inspired by the Quattro Pur Meal Initiative to sequester carbon in the soils worldwide. Uh, more than 100 participants came to Rome participate uh, in this um, meeting, more than 100 countries, and um, a lot of products came out of that. Of course, the proceedings, but also a summary report of the main findings, and some of the sci scientific highlights uh, found their way in two special issues of scientific journal, uh, the Journal of Global Change Biology and the Journal of Soil. The year thereafter, ITPS organized a global symposium on soil pollution. Again, more than 500 participants, and it produced, among other things, a global overview of soil pollution. Then there was the global symposium on soil erosion. Of course, it was one of the main threats to soil health worldwide. Uh, again, a very successful symposium. And one of the main products was that we increase in understanding how to further develop the global soil erosion map 
which is an initiative led by the Joint Research Center of the European Community. And this year we would have had the Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity, but, but because of Corona, we had to postpone that. So now it will be held in uh, 2021. Uh, but to prepare for that symposium, we worked quite hard on a report. Uh, it's the report uh, titled State of Knowledge of Soil Biodiversity. Uh, it will appear this year, so it's, it's more or less done. It's now a little bit editing and making a nice pictures, but it will can come out uh, very, very soon. Um, it's, it's a report written not by the ITPS, but um, we found 147 experts from all over the world to make a contribution here. So we, we were very happy that all these experts would give their time to write perfect, very nice, interesting sections to this uh, report. And most of them were scientists, but some of them were also from uh, governmental bodies and NGOs. It became an impressive amount of work. Uh, we sent it out for review uh, to the FAO contact persons of the member countries. The ITPS did a review. We sent it out to the conventional, conventional biological diversity contact persons and that of the GSBI, the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. Uh, members of the GRC of the European Commission did a review. Some uh, expert of the Global Soil Partnership of the FAO did the same. And of course, there are very scientists who also looked at the text and provided very useful uh, comments to make it a good report, state of the art. Well, at the, the, the table of contents is what you expect. Of course, we have an introduction. At first, it gives a sort of overview of the global distribution of soil biodiversity. It is about soil biodiversity uh, in relation to ecosystem functions and services. We will hear from that uh, more this session. The threats to soil biodiversity, the opportunities to, to, to preserve soil biodiversity, and also something about the state of soil biodiversity at the national level. I will come back to that later. There are very uh, key messages, many. Uh, I try to summarize the main findings, and if you summarize, Sometimes it becomes a little trivial, of course, but again, the report gives very much information in detail about the important role of soil organisms, all kinds of key processes, key soil processes in terms of food, climate change, pollution, remediation. It also shows that we know a lot about soil biodiversity, but we also need some more. Uh, more about productivity, but also in particular how to mitigate carbon of mitigate climate change through long-term carbon sequestration and so forth. So it also gives the guidance for new research programming. It also shows the, the, the rapid developments in new laboratory and analytical techniques. It provides complete new perspective of how we can look at soil biodiversity, how we can assess it, and also how we can better understand its functions and services. And in this way, it also gives uh, information, guidance, how we can come up with new policies that are required to protect soil biodiversity and its services. Uh, two minutes, Peter. Two minutes, please. Yes, I'm almost done. Uh, I end up with the survey connected to the report. We sent out a survey uh, questionnaire to all the member countries of the FAO, where we ask for information about biodiversity, procedures to assess it, research capacity building, policies and gap analysis. And 57 countries uh, came back with a response uh, of the uh, questionnaire. Uh, so that was quite a well provided information. And I give an example of the uh, survey. So there are many questions along these sessions. Now uh, this is an example of how country thinks that R is a main threat to soil biodiversity and then they could rank it, the, the several uh, um, things that may have a threat to soil biodiversity, for example, the use of pesticides, of monocultures, uh, um, uh, soil and water degradation, and they, they could rank it one to five, so the purple is five, very important, and the blue is not that important. And so there are many of these bar there diagrams, and it's very nice to see the thinking worldwide about soil biodiversity, the threats, 
and the opportunity. It was a, a large piece of work, and I must say, the secretariat of the GSP working at FAO, Ronald Farkas as being the head, did a tremendous good work to making all this information available to us. Then to end that, uh, Corona, unfortunately, it made that we had to postpone the sole biodiversity meeting, but in the meantime, uh, the ITPS thought it might be also a good opportunity to write something about what can we learn from the corona crisis in terms of sustainable soil management, in particular how sensitive to the globalization of food production systems. Uh, we wrote a scientific paper about it and recently it has been uh, published by the journal Soil, which is an open access journal, so also this paper is available to everybody. And here I would like to end my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter, for that comprehensive overview of the work of the IPTS. They're doing some uh, very nice uh, material, I have to say. Uh, I think uh, just, just to be sure of, of time, we'll uh, maybe look at uh, some questions and discussions uh, at the end of the end of the session. There are no specific questions uh, in the chat uh, at the moment, but uh, so let's move on. Uh, the next presentation uh, is from Professor Maria Briones. Uh, although she is um, uh, working at the University of Vigo in Spain, she's joining us uh, this morning from the UK. Uh, she's Professor of Ecology and Animal Biology and looking at links between land management, soil biota and uh, predominantly the, the carbon cycle. Uh, she has already had some experience at SOF as, as she was part of our Science in the City exhibition in Manchester uh, some four years ago. Uh, so it's nice to, to, to have her back in the SOF context. And today she will provide um, a brief introduction to soil biodiversity and how they relate to ecosystem services that we depend upon. So Maria, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Arvin. And um, like you said, thank you. Like you said, I also want to start thanking uh, Arwin for organizing this interesting session and for inviting me to be part of it. So as Arwin said, I'm a professor at the University of Vigo, but I'm also a regular visitor of the UK, so I like to keep my collaboration with the rest of the European uh, collaborators alive. And today my talk is about soil biodiversity ecosystem services. And um, because of the client limitations, I decided to give some key messages. Usually when you give a talk, you give, you present all your research and at the end you give your take home messages. Well, in this case, I decided to give them sequentially during my talk. And that's why I call it the Ten Commandments. Instead of Moises, I have this beautiful creature here, which is a columbula. So, so this is my first commandment. Uh, soil is an important habitat for billions of organisms. So in just one gram of soil, we can find um, thousands and billions of, um, of organisms. And these organisms vary highly in size. We have animals we can only see with a microscope that they are microorganisms, they live, live in the soil or they're associated to, to the roots, as we'll see in the picture on, on, on the right side. Others, like everyone, we can see with the naked eye. And we also have some big animals, what we call megafauna, like that more on the top. The second command is soil biodiversity is highly diverse, not only in sizes, as we saw before, but also in shapes. We have some that have legs, others, or many legs, and others that are like wormy creatures. They also have a variety of colors and they play different functions. 
So, but despite this high diversity, we are not fully aware of the full importance of soil biodiversity. So these are some messages, some important um, findings that actually soil is a hold nearly a quarter of our planet biodiversity. Up to 90% of the living organisms spend some part of their lives in the soil. In fact, soil is an essential habitat for 70% of the bees. We are very familiar to the bees that colonize our plants, but actually more than 20,000 species nest in the ground, like the one in this picture. We also think that most biodiversity has to be in very natural, pristine habitats, but in a park in the middle of a, of a huge city like New York, we can have hundreds of thousands of different species. But despite of this huge diversity, we only know the names, but we can only name 1% of those species. So compared to the 80% of plant species we can name, this is a very small proportion. My fourth commandment is everything that we eat, drink, breathe, the clothes that we wear, the materials we use, pass through the soil and soil biodiversity over and over again. So this means that Anywhere we look around us, we can find organisms working for us, building soil structure, controlling pests, sequestering carbon. And it could be also in the man made areas where we are cultivating our food that the organisms are helping us to produce more food. So, soil organisms provide many services uh, to us as humans um, and to the society where we live. So all these services can be put into money. And that's how we came with the word ecosystem services. Some scientists thought, well, if we can put some value money into one of each one of these services that the soil organisms provide, maybe that will help people or the society to care more about soil biodiversity. So as we just think, there's many, many services that soil organisms provide. So to make things easier, scientists also came up with a classification. So they made four big types of ecosystem services. The first type is provisioning that provides food, the organisms provide materials that we can use in our um, lives or in our business. We can also have what they call regulating services. Uh, soil organisms help to regulate the climate, to regulate the hydrological cycle, the composition, but also cycling of nutrients and other organisms. Then we have support and services, which include habitat support and maintaining the structure of the soil. And finally, which are more difficult to put into value, they are the cultural services. So now I'm going to start my list of commandments and give you some examples of each of these four main types of ecosystem services. So we will start with provisioning. Just a few examples, the easy or more direct service that organisms provide is plant growth. Here we have um, an experiment where we have two plants and one has no sterilized soil and this one has these organisms, which is a mycorrhizal fungi, which associates to the roots of the plant. And you can see visually how the difference in growth is between the two plants. Well, actually, these organisms that live associated to the plants, they give nutrients to this plant, usually nitrogen, in return for sugar. So these symbioses keep the crop growing. Um, 
those nutrients that the organism provides are essential because if any of the essential 15 nutrients we require for plant growth are missing, then we could have lower yield. There's another important uh, function that the uh, service that the organisms provide is to, when the plant is dying, is to recycle those residues. Usually when we uh, put things in the bin, if we are looking about the environment, we put them in different containers and we go to the recycling point. Well, here in the soil, we have a recycling factory, which is the soil organism. So they are the ones recycling all the dead residues. So actually, they produce by recycling, they provide nutrients to the plants and they build organic matter. And it has been estimated that approximately 25,000 kilograms of organic matter per year is produced by soil organisms. That's the weight of 25 tons. And there are some studies that prove if we lose biodiversity, we also slow down these cycles of nutrients. Another important service uh, that provides the organisms are antibiotics. Um, we know microorganisms produce a lot of pharmaceutical uh, products, especially in particular streptomyces penicillin. And they are um, half of the antibiotics that we use for one. And that's easy to put into money because the pharmaceutical business is quite important. So they, these are the proportion of uh, billions that the market is based on genetic diversity. Soil organisms also uh, help to break down contaminants. So we can have here a contaminated soil. Nothing grows, but if we have a healthy soil, the microorganisms degrade those contaminants and they can, they can restore that soil. But the organisms can also be used for indicators. So they can be like early warnings that that soil is becoming to be, or is starting to be degraded. And land degradation is another costly um, business and many countries are using a lot of money to spend a lot of money to regenerate or restore soil. And now going to move to another type of service which is regulating which is climate change. And here's an example we have healthy soil and um, perfectly stable system. When we create a perturbation and disturb the system, what happens is we lose some of the group so the opportunistic plants grow better than some opportunistic fruit, and those arrows, the black arrows, mean more CO2. So actually, soil organisms help to store carbon. Hydrology, uh, many organisms take a porous structure in the soil, and as I put here, elimination, for example, of airworms in the soil can reduce infiltration in more than 90%. So it's a huge effect on drainage, water drainage. And our regulating services, biological control, we are familiar with pests like these nematodes crossing on carrots and sweet potatoes, but we, want, we could also use biodiversity like this other nematode to kill other pests like this multiple. Um, again, we can put that into money. There's many money invested in pest control industry. And using soil biodiversity, like in Australia, this project can save a lot of money to the country. In fact, soil biodiversity losses have created what is called desired resistance. When you lose biodiversity, you don't have a healthy soil, you create antimicrobial resistance. That means that the, the organisms, the pathogens, get resistance to all the pesticides, herbicides, insecticides we put into the soil. So they become more resistant and those antimicrobial agents also decrease the biodiversity in the But recently, the some scientists, they also find out that this antimicrobial system, resistance is also linked to our human health and other effects. 
Next group of services are supporting, solve formation and maintenance, solve material management, uh, help the packages together, also some cast material produced by worms, and that holding this material prevents corrosion. So they are crucial for organic matter formation, aggregation, and corrosion. Pollination is another supporting services. We saw about the bees, also beetles, and some plants are highly specific. So unless they are pollinated by a specific species, uh, they won't grow. And again, pollination is another uh, market value. And finally, uh, cultural. Well, besides the direct use of soil biodiversity, there are other range of values that the services that soil biodiversity provide to humankind. And as I said, they are more difficult to define. One, is, one of them, one group, is what we call intrinsic values. They have cultural heritage, educational, recreational, religious, spiritual, spiritual values. One thing that is becoming more common today to talk about is the deepest value, is that what nature and biodiversity provides for future generations. And more recently, there's been a concern about how uh, preserving Pristine service uh, systems will impact on our um, health, human health. In the, in the last couple of years, there's been a number of papers that highlighted that soil biota that will help to increase nutrient security, diabetes prevention, lung conditions, which is asthma, um, stress resilience, and from this mental health. And in fact, Several projects have highlighted the, the good things that woodlands and green spaces provide to people's health and well-being. And it has been a disorder diagnosed that is nature deficit based of disorder. So there are several experiments going on in England and Denmark where they put patients that being in hospitals to do the recovery in forests, and they, they find out that the recovery is quicker, and also there's less incidents that going back to hospital because there's another illness coming from so they, they recover for a much longer time. And health issues and medical issues is quite a lot of costly um, disease that is uh, on the national services. So I will finish, we we'll continue now with the commandments. This is not and here, so that might call more services for humans. Um, there's been a recent paper saying that why infectious is disease research in this community ecology. And in fact, the only Nobel Prize for us all scientists was because we discovered these, all these um, antibiotics produced by um, soil organisms. But we, because, um, we are on the corona era. There's also uh, the suggestion that soil biota might help to prevent new pandemics. The seven message or commandment will be that two easy. Minutes, two, sorry? two minutes, sorry. Yeah. Two minutes. That's a few more slides. That if we lose this biodiversity, we will lose our services. So here we have on the left. All the services in an undergraded state. And as we degrade the system, we lose some of them, then we lose all of them except one, and then all of them. So, to wrap up, soil is a multifunctional system that provides all these services, and they can be classified in different groups, and they all sustain different businesses. We've seen all the market values for uh, producing food and raw material, pharmaceutical, but we also see the um, public health, but they also hold information for conservation. So this is another business uh, that depends on survival risk. Um, Peter highlighted just now policies to protect and value survival risk that are still in other states and they need to be implemented. So sustainable actions to protect specifically soil biota are still missing, but they are 
always flexible. It's impossible to protect everything. We just need to design the policies that identify priorities. And my last commandment will be that not only stakeholders and policymakers must step in preventing loss of soil uh, biodiversity, we also can do something. And here's what you could do to help and to maintain uh, this sustainability. So thank you very much for your attention. Over to you. Thank you very much, Maria, for that comprehensive view and some very striking examples there of uh, our dependence on uh, on soil biodiversity. Uh, I don't have any uh, questions from the audience at the moment, but uh, as I said, we'll, we'll come back to some discussion at the end uh, when we've gone through the the, the presentations. So the. Our next presenter then is a, a slight divergence from um, what we had before. We have uh, Henry Fair, uh, who's joining us from New York. Uh, I hope your coffee is quite strong, given the, the time difference uh, here. Um, he's an award-winning photographer uh, and an internationally recognized uh, environmental activist. And uh, his work uh, demonstrates uh, quite clearly the they say the impact of uh, human activities uh, on the environment uh, by highlighting specifically uh, let's say pollution issues and industrial activities that uh, are threatening soils uh, so um, I understand that today he's going to focus on nitrogen uh, and the impact that that has uh, uh, on a lot of the organisms that we've been uh, described by Maria so, um, Henry, I give the floor to you. Hello, and thank you. It's nice to be with you. Uh, I'm working on two screens, so I'm going back and forth. Uh, and let's hope, of course, with our uh, wonderful technology that um, we can, that this will all work. As, uh, as planned, it worked before when the moderator let me in. Uh, do you see now my, hello? All right, it worked before, let me get out. And, um, Is that better? Let's see. Well, it did work before. I think you just have to select the, the right screen, Henry. I think it's the, this is the preview. You need to show the presentation screen. And is it, is it proper now? So, I make pictures to try to explain science. I started this by my concern about the environment and 
the general um, the general ignorance of the of environmental issues and the complexity of environmental issues in the normal population. Somehow I realized that making aerial photos was the best way to, to make a picture which crossed the line between art and document. And by making, I realized, an abstract image, then it became something which would, um, which would hold people's attention and, and allow them to start to think about the issues behind the pictures. So I came to soil uh, indirectly. This is a picture I was flying up to Canada to photograph uh, a piece of land which was uh, to be developed, and this was just after a rainstorm. Uh, and this is Lake Champlain, and we can see it's an agricultural area, and there's a tremendous amount of erosion of soil down into the lake. And it was wonderful to me that a picture could tell such a story. And here, we see the mouth of the Mississippi River and the same thing. We can see a tremendous erosion coming down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and of course, we know that the, the dead area in the Gulf of Mexico from the erosion all the way up to Minnesota of agricultural lands um, is tremendous. So then I started to photograph a related issue. Um, I love maps, so I like to show people where, uh, where something is that I'm talking about. I started to photograph factory farming. And though it's not directly a soil issue, it is a soil issue because in factory farming, the practices are a little different between Europe and America, but we know that uh, environmental issues are worldwide. Um, we know that a tremendous amount of fecal matter is generated. A pig generates three times the amount of fecal matter as a human for the same body weight. Um, and we store in the US, we store that fecal waste in giant, um, giant reservoirs and it's legal in the United States to actually spray that fecal matter onto the soil. And of course what happens is this, um, this fecal matter which is sprayed onto the soil runs off into the water bodies and causes the death of these water bodies. And in this job, in this process, I made this photograph of the soil and it made me think of the relationship between our farming techniques and soils. So I continued this project and came to the subject of fertilizer by accident because I made this picture and this one. And as I make these pictures, I then go backwards to the science to try to understand this picture. And what it is, in fact, is the processing of phosphate. In the processing of phosphate, in which we use sulfuric acid with the phosphate rock, um, we generate a tremendous amount of acidic um, waste, which is stored in giant mountains of gypsum. You can see the gypsum on the edge and um, liquid acid phosphate waste. So I started to think about fertilizers and I learned about the three different types of fertilizer, the, the NPK, which are vital for all plant growth. And I learned about, uh, this is a factory where we synthesize nitrogen. 
And I learned about the Haber-Bosch process, which arguably is one of the most important discoveries in human history. Here's another um, nitrogen plant. Nitrogen, the synthesis of nitrogen, which uses um, natural gas, is a tremendous cause of climate change, but it's hard to photograph. Uh, we can only photograph the things which are visible. So my photographs of nitrogen are limited, but the photographing of phosphate is very uh, productive because phosphate processing and mining is very visible. And in the United States, we have tremendous phosphate reserves in the middle of Florida. And of course, this is a very valuable biodiverse area, but we're destroying it to get this phosphate rock. And we're doing it with these wonderful machines, which is called a drag line. Here's one. They actually construct these drag lines on site. And here's one being made. And the, the waste is very colorful and it's a photographer's dream. So I have gone uh, into great depths photographing the phosphate processing and mining um, techniques. And yeah. In some ways, the pictures must speak for themselves. And as I've gone around the world making these pictures, I find it everywhere. This is a phosphate processing plant in Canada. I was there to photograph the tar sands. And this is one in Spain, in Huelva. And it's uh, one of the most toxic sites in Europe, excuse me, in Europe. It was the site in 1998 of a tremendous leak. One of these, you can see here, uh, a retaining pond of this phosphate waste, acidic and radioactive. And one of the, wa the walls which contains this broke in a storm and released a tremendous volume of this toxic waste into one of the most valuable wetlands in Europe. Um, it was the subject of, here you can see the map, it was the subject of uh, tremendous lawsuits by Greenpeace and other environmental groups. And finally, it forced the, uh, the company to move their operation, to clean up and move their operations. But of course, in the end, we tend to move our toxic operations into places where there are less environmental regulations. So as an environmentalist and an activist, that's a source of great concern. Um, here we see another, sorry, I jumped topics. I next became concerned with herbicides and pesticides. And of course, usually for me, it starts with the making of a picture. And this picture of an airplane spraying herbicides on a field prompted me to think about that and the effects on soil. And then I became interested in glyphosate and I hope that, uh, that your screen does not block the text here. And then I started to think about, okay, where is glyphosate made? And I did the research and I found the multinational, which makes the largest amount of glyphosate and also the, uh, the genetically modified seeds, which are used in conjunction with glyphosate. That is just on the Mississippi River, north of New Orleans. And of course, this, um, this company has been bought by a German conglomerate. I tend to not use specific company names because I'm more interested in, um, in, get, in raising awareness and getting people to think about issues than I am in 
um, pointing a finger at any one company. Um, this is the waste at the uh, glyphosate manufacturer. And of course, being from the south of the United States, uh, cotton is a big um, presence in my mind. And cotton, I later discovered, is the crop on which we spread the most herbicides. And it is also um, a source of tremendous water depletion. And of course, then I thought about uh, NPK, then I moved on to Kalium and found a place in Germany where they mine Kalium. And um, so I had to go and photograph it. And two, I two found, minutes. what's that? Two minutes, I'm afraid. I'm almost finished. Fantastic. And there is a mountain of kalium waste, which is uh, polluting the uh, Vera River. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for having me. And now I will stop my screen share, although maybe you can... Good. I mean, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Henry, for that, I mean, some striking and uh, thought-provoking uh, images. Uh, I think we could watch your photographs all day long, actually, for uh, uh, if it wasn't for the, these uh, circumstances. Uh, I don't see any uh, immediate questions in the in the chat from the from the presentation. So um, time is a bit tight, but we will move on now. And say hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end to pick up some uh, outstanding threads. Uh, so thank you again. The next presentation is by my colleague uh, Alberto Orgiazzi. Uh, he works also in the GRC and he's also connecting to us uh, from the north of Italy but on the other region from us in Piemonte. Uh, he is our soil biologist. Um, he was the lead editor for the it's a groundbreaking um, magnum opus of the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. Uh, and he's been coordinating for us uh, one of the world's largest surveys of uh, soil organisms. And he's going to present some initial reflections on this now. So over to you, Alberto. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alvin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you something on how we study soil biodiversity. Thanks to the previ previous presentations, we know now what is soil biodiversity, why it's so important, also the um, pressures and threats that soil biodiversity is facing uh, nowadays, but how we study soil uh, biodiversity. So if you think of uh, a soil scientist, you may imagine something uh, boring, uh, a job that is not set so um, uh, satisfying, uh, spending all the day below ground, digging holes and studying this, uh, uh, this dirt. Um, actually, it's not like this. Uh, studying uh, soil and in particular soil biodiversity is a very challenging task. Also because you have to consider that there is now estimates that say that there are more uh, organisms in the soil than uh, stars in the sky. Uh, imagine that the number of um, organisms living in the soil is a, a number with something like 29 uh, zero after, while the number of stars is a number with something like 25 uh, uh, zero. So there is an incredible diversity of life uh, beneath our feet and studying it is very um, uh, challenging, also because, uh, as mentioned before by um, my colleagues, uh, soil biodiversity is facing many pressures, uh, many threats. Uh, some are common to also to above ground biodiversity, like pollution, um, climate change, but there are also something more specific to um, soil, as shown before by Henry, uh, soil erosion is one of, uh, of them. It has been estimated that every year in Europe, for example, we lose something like 
1,000 megaton of, uh, uh, of soil. Of course, losing soil, we are also losing the biodiversity, the organisms living in that, uh, in that soil. But also other threats like soil sealing. Um, every day, every second, every minute, we are losing uh, soil, which is covered by uh, um, concrete. So we need to study uh, soil biodiversity to understand how different pressures uh, have effect on uh, soil biodiversity. But as uh, said before by uh, Maria, soil biodiversity is not that easy to study because it's extremely diverse. We move from the microorganisms like fungi and bacteria to the mega uh, microorganisms like earthworms and, and moles. And in between, we have a large amount of um, organisms that are not that uh, well known, but still very important organisms like columbola, mites, isopods. They are all part of soil biodiversity. And if you want to study soil biodiversity, of course, you also have to include, uh, uh, include them. Studying biodiversity is important in order to develop maps of soil biodiversity, because if you uh, want to protect biodiversity and study the effect of uh, different pressures on soil biodiversity, you have to know how um, biodiversity is distributed. This is done, for example, for mammals, uh, where, you, as you can see, we have uh, clearly uh, mm, uh, developed map of the distribution of mammals across our planet. Uh, this is possible because mammals are quite uh, uh, known species, uh, countable, uh, easy to, uh, uh, to see. Uh, the same goes for plants. It's quite easy to uh, map the, uh, the biodiversity of plants across uh, the planet. But when you move to soil biodiversity, then the problem starts because, uh, as I said before, uh, most of the species are uh, not known or uh, we have a few information. Also, it's very difficult to define um, a species when you have to investigate microorganisms like bacteria and, uh, and fungi. So biodiversity, the study of soil biodiversity distribution is often seen as a, uh, as a black uh, box. However, over the last years, the study of soil biodiversity has uh, known an incredible revolution thanks to uh, molecular biology techniques, so the study of DNA. Indeed, there is um, an element uh, that is in common in all organisms living in our planet, planet, on our planet, from the smallest bacteria to the largest um, tree or animal, uh, which is um, uh, DNA. We all have DNA, but uh, our DNA is different from the DNA of a bacteria, of a banana, and uh, of a uh, cat, and so on. And what, is, uh, what has revo revolutionized the study of uh, soil biodiversity is the possibility to apply molecular biology techniques to um, environmental samples. So uh, the idea behind this is quite simple. Uh, you mm, can consider uh, uh, the um, each environment on the planet, from a gram of soil, a drop of water, but also our intestine as a, a, an organism. So you can extract, you get a sample, and you can extract the DNA from that sample. And the DNA will be um, the sum of the DNA of all the organisms living in that uh, um, environment. So using this principle, we are now able to extract DNA from soil, to sequence the DNA of soil and to characterize the biodiversity of uh, um, uh, the organisms living in that uh, uh, soil samples. Uh, that's what we are doing now at the European uh, level. Uh, uh, we have developed a large survey called LUCAS to investigate soil biodiversity using uh, molecular biology techniques. Um, we are um, analyzing the DNA coming from 1,000 samples collected, as you can see all the points in the map, collected in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, the idea is then to identify uh, the organisms, uh, particular microorganisms like bacteria and uh, fungi, because molecular techniques are more efficient on this kind of um, organisms. As I said before, every, uh, each organism has a specific uh, uh, DNA, so you can consider the DNA like a kind of barcode. You, uh, when you sequence the DNA, you read the, the, uh, the sequence of DNA, uh, and you are 
uh, often not always able to uh, assign that DNA to a specific uh, species of organism living in that, uh, in that soil. As I said, uh, uh, this is particularly true for microorganisms, but soil biodiversity is not just microorganisms. There is also a large amount of other organisms that are visible um, that can be studied and should be studied if you want to have a complete assessment of soil biodiversity. And to do this, it's still important to use uh, old, uh, old fashioned techniques like the microscope. Uh, so the importance of taxonomy, uh, this is uh, quite an issue now in uh, soil bio, uh, biology because there are a few people on the planet able to, for example, identify columbola or um, tardigrades or also earthworms. Um, by means of um, microscopes. So this is an important knowledge that must be uh, protected and cannot at the moment be replaced by new technologies based on the, the uh, uh, DNA. All this uh, study, uh, of course, large scale assessment based on the DNA uh, analysis are now um, put together. There are different initiatives, not just the European Commission, as I mentioned before, but also other similar uh, studies are going on in uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, we have something in Australia, in China, uh, also in, in Africa. The idea is then to combine all these uh, data sets to develop a first reliable assessment of soil biodiversity and then contribute to those reports that Peter was mentioning uh, before, developed by the FAO and the United Nations Convention on Biological uh, Diversity. The final goal of this effort is then to develop uh, a first uh, reliable map of the soil biodiversity uh, worldwide. Uh, this is the first attempt that we developed in uh, 2016 using uh, um, available data set. Uh, this was published in, the, um, published in the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas uh, by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. Of course, this is not the final map of soil biodiversity, uh, as I said before, there are still uh, uh, many organisms, group of organisms that are not included in this map. Uh, but it's, again, a, a first attempt, attempt to show that it's possible also to map soil biodiversity as we map plant and uh, in general above ground uh, biodiversity. It's important to map, yes, okay. Uh, it's important to map soil biodiversity because if you know what soil biodiversity is, you can also uh, um, evaluate the risk that uh, soil biodiversity is facing, the pressures that uh, I mentioned be, uh, before. And this is important, the the, also this gives the possibility to develop maps of risk to soil biodiversity and then think of, start of thinking um, uh, of possible measures specific to protect soil biodiversity. So if you want to prote protect an animal, uh, you, have to, you, you have to know where that animal uh, lives and then you can design uh, an, uh, protected areas or national park uh, surrounding the living area of that organisms. Uh, in this way, you can protect them, uh, protect it. Uh, the same should apply also to soil biodiversity. But of course, first you need to have reliable maps of soil biodiversity. Uh, last aspect of, uh, that I want to mention is the importance to uh, keep all this data accessible to everyone. Um, so uh, as I said before, uh, European Commission is working on that, but also other countries that are maybe have less resources than the European Union, uh, like Africa, and it's important also that um, collection of soil samples from these countries are made available so that also other uh, scientists can apply these techniques and assess soil biodiversity uh, in uh, countries that cannot uh, cover the cost of this type uh, of analysis. So at the end, I, I think just with this quick overview, show you how the uh, studying soil biodiversity in, in general, soil is not that boring. It's quite a variegated, uh, diverse job. Uh, you put together not just, you, you, 
don't have just to dig a hole, but you have to study also, the DNA. you can also study DNA. So living the lab, mapping, using computer, uh, IT uh, uh, techniques. So it's a very fascinating and uh, challenging uh, uh, job. And that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alberto, for that. Uh, very uh, graphic overview. Uh, as time is uh, uh, tight, I will move immediately now to, to Gabrielle Brawl. Uh, she's Professor of Geoecology at the University of Osnabrück in Germany. Uh, she's been President of the Soil Science Society of Germany and active in awareness raising uh, activities of soils. And she will close today's session uh, with a presentation on the relations bet between soil policy and biodiversity. And uh, I will share uh, the screen to give her presentation. Uh, where is it? Yeah. Hello, yeah, thank you, Arvin, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, I need uh, the help of uh, my Arvin. Um, because um, it's only a PDF, but I, I think it's working very well, and um, I will try to keep it to keep my presentation short. <clears throat> um, we heard a lot uh, about uh, the threats to soil biodiversity, and uh, we we learned a lot about uh, the very intense and high quality research, and and we learned uh, that um, soil commonly, pardon. Okay, um, next please. Uh, Arvin, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, next please. Do you see it? Uh, I only see the next, uh, the first, oh no. Oh, okay, now it's okay, yeah. Uh, and, <clears throat> uh, and we already heard that there is a connection between soil biodiversity, soil health, human health and this means, um, of course, we have to protect soil and for protection of soil and soil biodiversity, uh, we need uh, many stakeholders and especially uh, we need the politicians to make uh, the right uh, decisions uh, on this. And this is, of course, uh, very, very difficult. And the next slide, please. Next, please. It should be, I think there's a lag. Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yes, uh, definitely soil organisms are perfect communication tools and uh, we worked within Europe, I think, uh, for a long time now on soil communication and uh, a lot of active uh, people are working on this and I think we found out um, that really soil organisms are very good communicators. But, uh, and also you can reach politicians with this, but um, it's difficult when you are doing it only as a soils people or in a soils organization. And um, we made, uh, meanwhile, very good um, experience to work together with people from nature con conservation. Um, next slide, please. Um, these um, organizations are um, big organizations with many members and they are working on nature uh, protection and conservation uh, for a long time, meanwhile, and they have very good connections also to politicians. So they, they are very strong in implementing uh, things and um, they really have very, uh, they are very good in lobbying <clears throat> to the politicians. And um, yeah, so it's, it's really helpful to work together with them. And me, of course, um, they were focusing not that much on soils until now, but uh, we made the experience that uh, they are really open uh, to work together with uh, soil scientists and especially also, meanwhile, on the topic soil biodiversity. So first they, they were more focusing maybe on sealing and or land take in connection with urbanization. 
but um, <clears throat> we know meanwhile that really biodiversity helps a lot now also in this communication between nature conservation and soil and um, the, um, and, and also I think, of course, the, the global discussion on, uh, soil bi on biodiversity in general uh, helped a lot on, on this. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay, the, the next one, please. Okay, yeah, so we, um, uh, in the moment, uh, I think you are aware that in the moment, uh, Germany has the presidency of the Council of the European Union. And uh, within uh, this uh, connection, we, uh, we thought um, uh, that it would be also a good time uh, to have a political statement on soil and biodiversity demands on politics. Uh, and um, we um, had a big uh, celebration for the World Soil um, Day last year uh, on, on biodiversity and especially soil biodiversity. So th this is uh, one result of it and maybe it's also interesting for other um, people working in, on, on, soil cons uh, on soil protection and protection of soil biodiversity within uh, Europe. And we, and, and I think that's, um, that's really, um, it's, it's a sign for this very good cooperation. Uh, we could involve not only the SOILS uh, organization working on this, but also um, uh, Friends of the Earth or um, uh, World Wide Wild Fund of uh, nature, um, nature. So um, I, I would really um, recommend uh, to enhance this uh, cooperation. Um, then we can, I think, we can achieve much more on protection of soil biodiversity in the future. So to, um, to, to make it short, I think we are running out of time now. Uh, in the following, I have, um, and maybe you can go through the next slides, Arvind, please, because this is just in detail um, what I just uh, said. Um, so you can just go, I think, to the end of the, uh, okay, uh, third one. And the fourth one, I think, the next one, please. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think this, this fits very well, I think, to the last thing what um, uh, Alberto just uh, said, that we need uh, really a lot of, still of uh, data on, on this. Okay, so, uh, now it's uh, one uh, twenty-five, and we have five minutes for discussion. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabrielle, for for, for that uh, in very strong I say, connection to to policies. Uh, I don't see uh, any specific questions um, in the chat. Uh, does do any of the speakers uh, want to make any uh, sort of uh, additional or final reflections that, that maybe what comes to their minds uh, from what they've seen this morning? Did any of you learn anything that you didn't know before? Feel free. No. I have to say, I mean, uh, I think there was a, a, a very nice thread uh, running through the, 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 the discussions. I mean, it's from, let's say, the, the explanations of uh, the link between the biodiversity and the ecosystem services, the difficulties we have to measure it, uh, you know, the graphic illustrations of the industrial processes that uh, are affecting them, but uh, in most cases are probably out of sight and therefore out of mind. You don't look at, to say, the, the concept of nitrogen factory, even though, you know, we know that they exist. So uh, I think it was uh, a very comprehensive, uh, let's say, uh, uh, session. And I think it, it, it 
hopefully from the from the audience that we have it it uh it makes the case that uh, soils have to be uh, a higher priority i think for for everybody for all stakeholders for all society uh because indeed you know we do depend on it and it's so easy to 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 mess things up uh and so we really need to uh bring the the awareness to to people that uh, soils are fundamental to our existence and uh, uh, we, we need more action to preserve them and as uh, alberto showed in this final slide you know the, the concept of nature reserves for uh, soil organisms maybe isn't such a, a ridiculous concept that uh, uh, that it may be seen to to other people um, are there any final remarks from anybody well, I like it. Thank you very much for organizing, Armin. Yes, I was going to say also, thank you, Arwen. These are difficult times to organize something like this. I think it would have been much uh, uh, better for us to be there in, in person and maybe enjoying some uh, Italian hospitality uh, as well. And so maybe for the next uh, SOF, we can uh, try to bring you all together and, and uh, uh, wave the flag for healthy soils uh, again. So I'd, I see that the clock is ticking down. Thank you very much. I don't know what happens at zero zero. Maybe we get launched. I think we we'll probably get kicked out. <laughs> Ciao. Uh, thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao.